Welcome, everyone, to the State of Florida Football Recruiting Report. I am Brian Smith, and I'm going to be doing this report several times per week. And as we get closer to National Signing Day, it will actually be Monday through Friday. Just want to kind of do an overview. It'll be a little longer today than most days. And this is basically going to be about four or five different programs and anything that's really interesting within the state of Florida with high school football, too. If a, if a player commits to Oregon or something like that, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw that in as well. But the primary is to give a consideration to Florida State, Florida, UCF, and Miami. If there's anything else on the in-state schools that's interesting, Florida International, USF, etc., I will do that as well. With that, today I'm going to go over the four recruiting classes that matter the most, and that's the ones I just mentioned. Florida State, Florida, Miami, UCF, whatever order you want to go, it doesn't really matter. Just going to talk about those four, what's happened and what could happen, because some of them are having really bad seasons, and I'm sure people know which two I'm talking about. And we'll see how that kind of goes as far as decommitments and stuff. I'll, I'll give a little speculation on that here in just a minute. But let's just start off with the Gators. Um, I was just looking at their class last, so I'll, I'll start with them. No particular order here. Florida has 14 commitments. The last commitment they had was Farmer. His name's Jalen Farmer out of Covington, Georgia, East Side. It's a greater Atlanta area, I believe, and he's he's a massive kid. He's an interior offensive lineman, could be a center or a guard. Probably not going to play tackle. Just watch some of his film, though. He has great feet for a guy as big as he is. I'd say conservatively, he's 330. Just kind of looking at him, listed around that weight, but sometimes they're a little heavier when they're big boys. This young man has one thing you can't teach, though, and that's those feet. If you have feet like that, you can do some things. So I like him as a commitment quite a bit. They have a couple other kids that they had committed here recently. I'm going to pull it back up. But I'm not sure that the Gators are going to have a top five class, but they've got a chance to, quote, unquote, do the most important thing, and that's fill their needs. If you can fill your needs, it's important. And I'm going to get into something the NCAA has just ruled on that's going to change it for Florida and every other school. It's complex, unfortunately, but it's – absolutely vital to talk about if you follow recruiting this is the first time in my lifetime and i've followed it since the early 90s that this has happened but then again covid didn't happen and that's what this is about so florida's situation is unique because they have a couple of guys that can play different positions like julian humphrey can play free safety can play corner play receiver he's that kind of athlete they like him at corner florida's doing really good with those kinds of players skill guys that can move isaiah bond can fly he's out of buford georgia Really like his speed and his athleticism. Kids like that. They have a good class. Is it elite like some of the Urban Meyer classes? No, it is not. They're not getting the same level of defensive players. They're just not. They're getting good players. They are. But Shamar James, Julian Humphrey, those two guys can play for anybody. I'm not sure how many of the other kids would fall into that. We'll see. Uh, EJ White sees a kid they really like. He's one of their more recent commitments as well. He committed in the middle of August on the 16th. Uh, Jamarian Burt's another versatile kid. I like their class. I do. But I need to see a defensive tackle that is purely a DT that can rush the pass. A defensive end that has experience and is used to playing in the big time and, and doing it. They, they've got one kid committed out of Miami, Knowlton. That's, it's a pretty good athlete. I've seen him before, but I'm not sure he's an impact guy. He's probably year three guy. That's okay. The one thing that I do like is the upside of their offensive line. I, I just mentioned that they got the farmer kid, and he's got a tremendous amount of upside. David Connor is really unique for them. David Connor plays at Deerfield Beach. He started getting offers kind of late. He's kind of like uh, Leighton Nelson, the kid that committed to UCF. But didn't have any offers, and all of a sudden he got just boom. He got several. Connor kind of fits that mold as well. 6'6", 270, 280, somewhere in that range, can move. Has length, going to need some time to develop, but that's a kid they got, and he committed on the 17th, so it's the day after they get two back-to-back -back there. It's the day after they get Lightsey. It's not bad. With that, I might as well bring up the, the, the elephant in the room with recruiting. Because of the transfer portal, and I'm going to give the shortest version of this I can. It's There's no way to make it completely short, though. It is complex. The NCAA is instituting a rule for – up to seven players that you lose to transfer, you can oversign. A normal recruiting class, the max is 25. So if you have seven guys that leave your program, you could then sign 32. 
part of the reason for this, and it's something that I've had high school coaches all over Florida screaming about, and, and I told them there's nothing I can do. Colleges are picking players out of the portal over high school players because they want impact players, older guys, more physically developed. There's no way to fix that. The NCAA is trying to help out the high school kids is what this really is about, in, in my opinion. Maybe, uh, there, maybe there's something else. I don't know. How long that goes on, I don't know, but the, the rule – is at least for this year and the little bit of snippet that I saw on the web today, I forget which company or had it, but the NCA commented on, and they think it's probably going to be more than one year until I see it. I won't believe it. Like anything else, the NCAA is incredibly inconsistent and uh, it's not exactly my favorite institution and I'm being very kind, but with that seven, with where Florida sits now, you can take a few more kids and be a little bit more, of a projection class, meaning some guys with high upside, but may have a low, low ceiling or a low floor as well. And if you miss on one or two, if you're taking 28 kids, 30 kids, it's not really going to hurt you where you can't miss though with Florida, just looking at their class, they need some defensive linemen and they need another corner to go across from their main guy, Humphrey. You in the sec East, if you're going to compete with Georgia, the way they're recruiting, that's what they have to do. That's their primary rival, uh, especially with Florida State, the team I'm getting ready to talk about. With what's going on in Tallahassee, George is the only thing they have to worry about. They're going to stop Florida State. That's just the way it is. So you have to look at this and say they need to up their game a little bit, but they also could take some kids, not just in Portal, but some more kids in Florida. They're kind of late bloomers. I'm curious to see what happens with that. Florida played Alabama extremely tough, and while they brought in several guys – for visits and, and Ward only knows where some of these kids will go. A lot of them just went just because it's Florida, Alabama, and they wanted to see Alabama play more than they did Florida, quite honestly. I know uh, Preston Cushman, for instance, went up to Florida. He's still going to go to Ole Miss. I, I know the kid. He's going to go to Ole Miss. That's fine. And there's other kids, too. More the kids come into Notre Dame. He's, he's going to go to Notre Dame. If they get him on campus, it doesn't cost them anything, really. You know, it's, it's on their dime. They came up. So at least Florida's swinging for the fences. With that, the only other thing I will say about Florida's class right now is they need a home run hitter. What I mean is a headline player beyond the quarterback. Their quarterback I love, by the way. I was one of the first ones to really get on him. I thought he was the best guy in the, at the Texas uh, Elite 11. I think I was the only one to have him rated that high, but he is really good. If you look at Florida's class, if they could get Evan Stewart out of Texas – He's arguably the best player in the state of Texas, which speaks volumes to begin with. If they can get Evan, he's a wide receiver that's very twitchy. And he is a kid that is looking at Alabama and LSU and a whole bunch of programs. But the Gators are rumored to be pretty high on his board. If he comes to play with his buddy Nick Evers, who's from Flower Mound, that could be pretty interesting. That could be pretty interesting. Because Evan's the kind of kid that can play as a freshman. And, and the Gators, um, they don't normally play a whole lot of younger guys. Dan Mullen is a seniority guy. I'm sure he will deny that publicly on his grandmother's grave, but he is. And uh, this kid might be the exception, though. He, he's very, very special player, and he could be a punt returner. He's a guy who could be slot. He could be outside. Not many freshmen play at Florida, a receiver, et cetera, but he, he might be one. If they can get him, it changes their class. So they're definitely the top of the board in the state of Florida, and it's not even close, in my opinion, because of what they have ahead of them now, that they were really close with Alabama. Now, we're not just talking about the class, but like their projection with the class where it's at, plus how they're doing in the season. Because kids now look at what you do in the, during the year that they're getting ready to sign. It used to be it was a year or two later impact. It's not anymore. It's immediate. If you're really bad, it hurts you immediately. If you're really good, it helps you immediately. Florida's pretty good. I think they're a top six team nationally. I know they lost to Alabama, but so is everybody else. And they only lost by a couple points. So I think Florida's going to finish pretty strong in recruiting. They'll have a top eight class somewhere in that range. Maybe not top five, but they'll be in the top eight somewhere. Moving on to Florida State, and this is one of the most difficult classes to project in the country, if not the most difficult class. Florida State <clears throat> currently sits with 18 commitments. Florida State is also currently sitting at 0-4. They are terrible. There's no way around it. They stink. They find ways to lose. They beat themselves. They are hard to watch. 
and it is painful to talk about Florida State football. I, I like their head coach. He seems like a really nice guy. I have no idea what's going on in Tallahassee, and it, it, it's really none of my business what's going on in their practices, but it makes one wonder. It looked like man coverage, basically, on that last play against Jacksonville State, and regardless of what it was, I guarantee you every recruit in the state of Florida watched that play multiple times. That's not going to help. Kids in Georgia, not going to help. Kids in Alabama, not going to help. Florida State's in trouble. I was just looking at their schedule. And this is really important. Who are you going to be? You're 0-4. You lost to Jacksonville State. You have Syracuse coming up. That's not a gimme. They're giving up less than 18 points a game. Just looked it up. They're a solid team. They, they get after the quarterback. Guess what Florida State stinks at? Protecting the quarterback. They've got some good running backs if they can open some holes for them. They've got where they do okay running the ball sometimes, but they, they don't pass protect particularly well. If Florida State loses to Syracuse, don't laugh when I say this. It's not out of the realm. They lose 10 or more games or more. They still haven't won a game yet. You think that might impact recruiting? <laughs> How many of the current 18 commitments would stay with the Seminoles if Florida State finished 3-9, and 2-10, and 10, 11 any, anywhere in there? How many? Half of them maybe? Um, I'm not trying to pick on them, but they're so bad in finding ways to lose. What else am I going to say? Um, it'd be great for them to kind of get going again. Maybe it's this week. I have no idea. They're so unpredictable from quarter to quarter, not game to game. Quarter to quarter, it's hard to say. Their pass rush is really good. I think Jermaine Johnson's one of the best defensive ends in the country. He's, he's legit, and they still stink. I don't understand it. With that, here's the other thing. They still have an opportunity to play Clemson. They still have an opportunity to play Miami. If they surprise me, and I hope they do, and they play good at least, and they're competitive, if you could beat 21-14 to 14 against Clemson, nobody's going to yell at you. If you could beat 31-3, to three, that's another story. Clemson's not very good right now, especially you'd get less credence. They, they just lost uh, Brian Breezy, their stud defensive tackle towards ACL. Hope he has a good recovery. Their offensive line stinks. They don't have the same kind of quarterback play because they don't run read option. There's There are a lot of problems in upstate South Carolina. Clemson is not even in the same stratosphere with where they used to be. However, even with Brian Breezy out, that front seven is top five to top eight in the country conservatively. Georgia and Alabama still might only be the two teams ahead of them. With Breeze, I mean, Breeze is a first-round pick if, he, if he'd have stayed healthy for three years. He'd, he'd have been a first-round pick. Now in his sophomore year of that, who knows? But they got them coming up pretty soon. If you could be competitive or somehow figure out a way to beat them, it changes your recruiting fortunes astronomically. But I digress. I, I just wanted to bring that up because with 18 commitments, and they're doing – I mean, I like their class – it's a good class. They got a ton of size. They, they went with beef up front, 350. Um, if, if you like power football, that's where they're headed. And they've got talented running backs, and they got Travis Hunter coming in, who's arguably the best player in the country. If you have not seen Travis Hunter play, shame on you. You need to go look him up. Just type in uh, Travis Hunter. You won't have to type in anything else in whatever search engine you want. It'll come up. Just hit video. The rest will take care of itself. Can't teach it. I've had the pleasure of seeing him play live from 10 feet in front of me. It's different to see live. I'll give you that. But that dude is special. He'll be their best player by the middle of his freshman year at the West, at, at the latest. He's going to Florida State. Everybody keeps talking about he's going to – He can. he's not. He's going to go to Florida State. That's where he wants to go. With that said, the kid that they had most recently commit to them, and this concerns me, and it goes back to their bad start. On the 2nd of August, Jalen Early committed. Big offensive guard out of Duncanville, and he can move his feet. Really like him. Good football player. Really good football player. That's August 2nd. August is a really down month for commitments because high schools and colleges, they don't have much to do with recruiting because they're in fall camps. Season's starting for high school. It's complex for scheduling. It just doesn't work very well. Fair enough. But since the season started and Florida State is absolutely terrible, minus eight, they were competitive with Notre Dame in a weird game. They were down 18 and came back. But since then, they lose three more games. They have had no commitments. And now the stigma of what I talked about just a moment ago kind of hovers over their program. 
hey, when are they going to win a game? When are the Knowles going to win a game? So if they don't figure it out pretty quick, and let's just for entertainment's sake look at their schedule. Uh, Syracuse this week is at home. It's on It's on the slate for 3.30 this weekend. But then they got to go to North Carolina. That's not going to be a win. They have UMass after that. And they got two weeks to prepare for that game. If they can't beat UMass at home with two weeks to prepare, I'll go ahead and tell you right now, that staff is not going to be there next year. I don't care what the buyout. It's not going to happen because that means they got a chance to go over. Pretty much. That means you're not going 0 12 anywhere in a power five and not getting canned. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's UMass. Surely to God, they'll beat UMass. Other than that, though, they got to go right after that. Florida State goes to Clemson. And I know Clemson's not normal. They're not very good by Clemson standards. They're not winning that game. They go back home and they play NC State, the team that just beat Clemson. Got a good quarterback, pretty solid team, not dynamic per se, but pretty good. Then they host the rival, the Miami Hurricanes. Miami's struggling. I'll talk about them here in just a second. But Miami still has a quarterback that Florida State does not. We'll talk about that in a second, too. But I'll take Miami in that game. I don't care where it's played um, just because I, I like, I'm a big fan. So the quarterback situation at any school matters a lot. I'll take Miami. Then Florida State goes to BC. That's the team that just beat an SEC team in Missouri and did so with a quarterback that nobody really knew anything about because the main quarterback for BC broke his arm or his hand or something is out for the year. They have a pretty good coach there. I don't think he's long for Boston College. He'll probably be in the ACC or Big Ten or something at a more prestigious school. Maybe he comes down south to SEC, but he can coach. Florida State's not winning that game. And then they finish the year at Florida. No way. Not happening. So all of this impacts recruiting because recruits watch the games just like members of the media, like myself, watch the game, just like alumni, just like fans. If Florida State does not beat Syracuse and UMass, who are they going to beat? North Carolina, Clemson, NC State, Miami, BC, and Florida. Those are the other games they have remaining. Good luck. I, I see several decommitments coming. That's just my opinion. We'll see. Um, Moving on to the University of Miami, their last commitment was from a player I know pretty well, and it's it's interesting that they're getting these guys, but Ed Reed is on their staff, and Ed Reed is one of the greatest players that ever donned an NFL helmet. He played at the University of Miami. He has returned to his alma mater to help out the program, and he's coaching the secondary. He's killing it in DB recruiting, but people want to be around Ed Reed. I get it. I don't have any problem with that at all. Mark Keith is at Evans High School in Orlando. Great kid, real long, free safety. He can play. But he committed in early August, and the Hurricanes have nine commitments. Of those nine commitments, here is, here is the problem. And this is earlier this year when I did a, a similar kind of report. It's kind of a random one, though. I mentioned that I'd never seen this in my lifetime and probably never will again. Again, Miami has nine guys committed. Looking at their list, how many of those guys would you think are from South Florida, the number one place in all of the country for high school football? What do you think? Five of them? At least three, right? Zero. Zero commitments from their home area. Not freaking one. Not one. Not a kid from Palm Beach, not a kid from Broward, and not a kid from Dade, the same county that is where Miami is located. And Coral Gables, to be specific about where the University of Miami campus is. It's within the city of Miami. Not one. That tells me a very primary point about the University of Miami's football program, and that's the local coaches do not support the head coach and or the staff very much at all. For the longest time, it was known that the greater Miami area funneled a lot of kids there. They wanted to push a lot of kids there. A lot of the coaches were fans, and I know some of the coaches, and there still are fans, but they're pretty ticked off, and they are not Manny Diaz fans, and neither am I. I don't think he's very good. That being stated, a dead rat can recruit to Miami. How hard is it? How hard is it? 
great school, really good school. It's business school is one of the best you'll find anywhere in the South or really anywhere along the East Coast. It's in Miami. They have tradition. They've won national titles. They're in a Power Five conference. Great weather. You're in literally the best city in America for high school football. And you have zero commitments locally. They are an atrocity in recruiting right now. Absolutely atrocity compared to what they could be. If it wasn't for Ed Reed, they may not have five kids committed. And Ed can recruit, and hes I've heard good things about him as a person. I don't know him. But his name's going to carry weight, and it, by all means, it should. What in the world is going on where you can't project your program in some kind of – I know they've had a bad start. We'll talk about that momentarily. That doesn't help. But you can't get anybody to commit locally? Nobody? I, maybe there's something I don't know, and they got five silent commits. But why are they silent if that's the case? Zero local commitments. The only kid that's even remotely South Florida is a good player out of Fort Myers, Chris Graves. He's an athlete. I've seen him play. He could really run. He could really run. They're projecting him to corner. I saw him about a year ago play up in Lakeland against Lakeland Christian. He can he can go. But that's still not even the right coast, let alone the Miami area. So I'm a little bit concerned about what they've got going on. Um they're recruiting more out of state. I mean, except for Graves, they've got, again, nine kids committed. The University of Miami right now, they have Mark Keith and they have Graves. Only two kids out of there are nine or even from the state of Florida. I mean, they used to recruit Texas and California in spot recruit, especially for quarterback. And if there was a special skill player or something, sure. I mean, that, that's fine. But the way this looks is like they're just going out and they're they're almost like drafting in a sense because nobody's local. I don't see that as a very good thing. I'm curious, does Miami, does Miami survive this recruiting class? Meaning like, is it kind of the last death knell for them? Because they're a 500 football team by the end of the year, probably at best. And I'm being nice. Um, they're going to beat Florida State but that's not saying much. Um, let's just see what their schedule is because surely they're going to finish a little bit better than the Knowles again, but that's, that's like low hanging fruit. Miami played terrible and we all knew it against Michigan state. They came back and they beat central Connecticut state. I mean, what is that? That's, I hope you could beat them. They've got Virginia, North Carolina, NC state, they go to Pittsburgh, which will be a problem for them because they can rush the passer and they can't pass block. They've got Georgia Tech, who's vastly improved. That ought to be a pretty good game. They go to Florida State, for the love of God, they'll beat Florida State. Virginia Tech, that's the same team that beat North Carolina earlier this year. Then they finish the year on the 27th of November at Duke. They probably beat them. I'm going to guess they're going to finish somewhere around 500 at best. And Considering they have nine commitments and they haven't recruited the state of Florida very well, that does not deem a good situation for them moving forward. They need to surprise me. And I, I mean, they're capable of beating anybody that's left on their schedule. I'm not saying they're not. And they have as much, if not more talent than probably all of them. With that being said, if you're Miami, you need to recruit your area better and you need to do so by winning some games that are meaningful. They just laid egg after egg after egg. And at some point, kids are just going to back off from really looking at your program. I'm still a Derek King fan. I will claim that. I just feel sorry for it. The guy, I'm, I'm looking at their some of their stats. <coughs> They've given up 12 sacks already. Not terrible, terrible, but it's not very good. <coughs> Three sacks a game they're giving up, and he's one of the most athletic guys, if not the most athletic quarterback in the country. Um, most teams with their offensive line, that'd be about 15 to 18. Derek can get you out of a lot of problems. So Miami's concerns are the same ones that I have. I'm sure they're looking at their staff like, why can't we get local kids? If they're not, then they need to be fired anyway. Um, keep Ed Reed, just get rid of some other guys. But they need to win some games immediately. And quite frankly, if they don't, there, there are problems. They got Virginia, North Carolina coming up, two quality opponents. 
but the North Carolina game carries some cachet. That game's very important. That's the team that shellacked them last year and ran for 500 and some odd yards and just bludgeoned them. If they don't want some payback for that game, then I don't know what Miami has going for it. The only other thing I will say is they need to finish without another ugly loss because that's going to impact what I'm looking at on my sheet. Two guys out of nine committed from the state of Florida. Nobody from deep South Florida, meaning the greater Miami area. They need to figure it out. <laughs> they need to do so immediately. One last team to talk about, and that's UCF. This is an interesting group. Nine of the 12 are from in-state. They're just the opposite of Miami. And their last four are from the state of Florida. All during the month of August, which is kind of rare. It's a little odd, actually. <coughs> Wayton Nelson on the 5th of August. They got Cam Moore on the 10th. Grant Stevens on the 22nd. And then Quan Lee on the 31st. Now, like most teams, they haven't had much action in September. They're probably not going to. October recruiting will pick back up. This is for everybody, not – not just because Florida State struggling or Miami struggling or, or whatever. It's hard to get commitments right now because kids are really busy, a lot of stuff going on. But once we get to October, you're two months from signing day, which is on the 15th of December. It's very important. Kids will start looking at it. And then in November, the kids that, whether they're committed or not, and some are still committed and taking visits, they will make a final decision. So right now we're in a little bit of a lull, but that'll change. UCF is now arguably out of these four the most unique from one particular perspective because of the rule that the NCA brought about that I mentioned at the beginning of the show while discussing Florida state, they're a big transfer school. Anyway, <coughs> they need to find a way to get some more high school kids, surely, but they need to hit the transfer portal and score on both sides of the ledger. I don't know how deep they will go into the high school thing because they were planning to take a pretty small class. I almost can't grade what they're going to do because now they got to readjust a little more than most schools. Perhaps Miami was looking at it that way a little bit too. And they've always been big on the transfer portal. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't be shocking. It doesn't excuse them on the whole Miami area thing, but still they, they've done a really good job over the years with the portal. UCF in one way is very similar to Miami. They need a headliner, a guy that's going to kind of get them over a hump, a local kid, et cetera, like that. Maybe they, they get somebody to flip or, or whatever. They've done pretty good, but they need somebody else. I know they were really hoping for Gabe Dendy. They're not going to get Gabe Dendy. They're not going to get him. He's out of Lakeland. That's you know an hour from campus or whatever, 40 minutes. They need to add somebody else. But if anything, they need to be very active at just filling their needs. It's got a balanced class offensively, defensively, kids that can run. They have focused on speed, on defense. I like the class overall. I just don't know how they're going to approach it. Are they going to save scholarships? Are they really going to push for every kid that you have up to seven that leaves? You could use a high school rec recruit for that guy. Like I said earlier, the NCAA is trying to help out the high schools, the high school coaches, players, et cetera. It's a good thing. Will UCF be in a position to get the kids they want? You might see some interesting battles in the state now that I think about it between all these schools as well as schools like Clemson and Ohio State, Notre Dame and Alabama and Texas A&M, all the schools that come down here anyway to recruit with the opportunity to get a few more kids. They may not even fight a kid that's, hey, coach, I'm going to transfer. Sometimes they try to talk them out of it. Maybe they don't. <clears throat> Maybe they just let it ride. So that's something to think about. It's very possible. UCF could be in a position where all of a sudden they're recruiting somebody kind of mildly and they're like, well, we don't have any room, but now they will. They could be in a, in a more competitive battle with some schools they don't normally recruit as much against, like an Alabama or something, and have that opportunity to go up against them. That'll be very interesting. They've gotten a lot of cachet within the state this year just from going around talking to people. I, I cover UCF or Inside the Nights on Fan Nation powered by Sports Illustrated, and that is something that's pretty interesting is how much buzz they've gotten. People like Gus Malzahn, just like I do. He's a good dude. That, that could do something for them, those extra scholarships. Let's say they just have five. I bet you they would use at least three of them within the greater state of Florida area 
maybe a South Georgia kid or something too. They like recruiting South Georgia. So that's something to think about. That's going to wrap it up for this edition. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry the news isn't more positive, but I tell it like it is. I see two uh, programs being basically set ablaze by their own selves on how they're playing, and it's going to impact recruiting. Uh, one of them, the recruiting is not going good anyway. The other one is probably going to collapse, barring something that changes on the field. So, And I hope I'm wrong, and I hope Florida State turns it around because college football is not better with Florida State going 2-10. and 10. It is not. So with that being said, <clears throat> we need we need better football in the state of Florida. The kids are going to keep leaving. The kids are leaving at an alarming late rate, and that's one of the reasons the schools aren't playing very well. So I'm going to be doing more of these reports, going to do a couple of them a week. I'll probably do one Wednesday, Thursday, Friday each week going into games. I'll, I'll preview a game tomorrow. I've got some prospects. I'm going to the Tampa Catholic at uh, Berkeley Prep game two local private schools here in Tampa where I live going to be talking about the kids that are committed to schools, aren't committed to schools, the programs themselves, the type of football they have, etc. going to preview that game a little bit, but I'm also going to be keeping a close eye on this stuff. Uh, seeing the Florida schools in a weird state of flux is unusual for me. I grew up with all three of these schools finishing in the top eight and recruiting every year, oftentimes three of them in the top five. And then UCF at that time wasn't wasn't even Division One, but right after they were, you know, they still they still weren't as relevant as these three. But now they're they're catching up with Miami, and they might catch up with Florida State if, if they fall apart. So it's interesting to me because the dynamics have changed so much in the last just two years with UCF, Florida State, and Miami. Florida is a little more status quo. It's the one stable program out of the four with UCF, the wild card that could go really really high. So. With, I, with that all in mind, again, I'm going to be doing this two or three times a week. And then once we get into October, probably going to move it up. It may even be a daily show, depending on what's going on. Talking about some of the kids that are going out of state, do some film reviews, talk about different things like that. Recruiting is my thing. I love it. I've always followed it. And the state of Florida, to me, is the most fascinating of any of the 50 states because the kids go everywhere from this state. You could have a kid go to Oregon State. You could have a kid go to Boston College. You could have a kid go to Alabama. Nothing is surprising. So Brian Smith signing off. Everybody have a great day.